All right, I am so excited to introduce today's guest to you. Her name is Teresa Scanlon, and some of you might know her, but in 2011, at the age of 17, she won Miss America, and that was the uh, youngest person ever to win in like over 70 years, right, Teresa? That's right, yes. Um, you went on to compete in Miss World America in 2015 and came in fourth runner-up. But your story does not end there because in 2018, you joined the Air National Guard and graduated from basic combat training in the top 10%. That's crazy. But there's still more. So okay, you just finished your second year of law school at UC Berkeley uh, School of Law. And on top of that, you are a mom to an adorable little boy, right? That's right, Jace, yes. So I thank you so much for coming because I love your story so much. And I think that you are the perfect example of the art of reinvention. And, you know, we live in this Photoshopped world of social media and like filtered everything. Like, in fact, the video I think on Zoom is filtered right now for me. <laughs> anyway. You know, and yet, yet all of us have struggles and you had, you hit some bumps in the road along the way too, and you're divorced, right? Mm -hmm. So first welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your story? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think you, you covered a lot of the highlights there, but I guess uh, one thing I always try to tell people is that while the highlights are sort of the things people know most about me, um, there's definitely the valleys and the low points as well. And in between all of that was when I got married and divorced. So I had been Miss America in 2011. I had been public speaking for years. Um, got married in 2015 and divorced a year later in 2016 after having my son. So um, here I was with a five-month-old and newly divorced, did not have a college degree yet. I had stopped working for several years um, and I really didn't know what to do at that point. So that was sort of what was the interim of all of those years. And then recently <laughs> kind of restarted my life, restarted my son's life um, and have been doing all of the things that I had always wanted to do, which has been a pretty amazing feeling. So you had pretty much an infant at the time that you got divorced. So how did you make right. that decision? Well, I think um, having him helped me make that decision uh, because without getting into too many details of uh, why I needed to get divorced and why I needed to leave, I really looked at him. Um, he was two months old at the time. And I kind of just realized I had a decision of what I wanted his life to be. Um, and the kind of marriage that he was going to grow up seeing, the kind of mother and father he was going to grow up seeing. And I was in such a dark place um, due to everything that was going on that I knew I would certainly never be the mother I wanted to be in that situation. Um, and so honestly, I think he was the reason um, that I made the decision to leave because I knew at that point I had the chance to make a new life for him. Um, and make it something positive and something good. And that was just never going to be in that situation. Um, so leaving, moving halfway across the country, moving back to my parents' house with an infant was definitely never something I wanted to do. Um, and it was the hardest time of my life. Uh, those, that year, maybe two years, um, I probably cried every single day. <laughs> and um, that was the grieving process I needed to go through before moving on. And I think that was pretty important. It's, and, and thank you for sharing that because I think that everyone's divorce story has that piece of it. And that's mm -hmm. what people aren't talking about because I had the same thing. Mm -hmm. I was, that was my story too. A year after, I, I don't think there was a day that I didn't cry. And, yeah. but it wasn't the face that I was putting on out in the public. Right. And I think right. that that's what we do is we put on that happy face and we're the strong person, but really Definitely. we're all doing that same thing is crying. So how did you crawl out of that? <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, you're so right. When you say that, I felt during that time 
that it wasn't talked about enough because I thought I was the only person that took it this hard because so many people want to sort of just jump right to, and now I'm happy and now I'm fine. So I would have, you know, very well-meaning people who would say, oh, hey, you know, I'm 10 years out and I'm remarried and I'm in love and all this. And that's the last thing I wanted to hear, honestly, because mm -hmm. I was so in this place of this is never going to end. I'm never going to be happy again. I am in so much pain and nobody's talking about the pain that they experience. So clearly I'm the only one, you know, who experienced this much pain. You know, I'm the only one who laid on my floor in the fetal position <laughs> crying right. every day, you know? And then when you have a child too, I think unfortunately some of the messaging can be damaging because sometimes we talk about getting divorced and you have to put on a happy face for your kids, which is true for the most part to protect them. But what I heard was people basically saying, Oh, your child is all you need and you should be happy because you have your child. And believe me, he's my world, but that doesn't take away the pain somehow, nor does it make you not lonely. I felt guilty for being lonely. I felt guilty for grieving. I felt guilty for feeling depressed because I had this beautiful baby boy and he was the greatest thing, but that just doesn't take away the grief of divorce. And I think sometimes we we allow people to grieve when they lose a spouse to death, but not when they lose a spouse to divorce. So the first thing that I really had to do was give myself time to grieve. And I literally, this is how like serious and conscious I was about it, that I sat down and I said, I'm going to give myself two years to be as depressed as I want. I literally <laughs> said, you have permission to be sad, angry, depressed, whatever you feel, you feel for two years. And I'm not even going to try to quote unquote, get better before that two year period. And part of that was due to some books I was reading and a divorce recovery workbook I was working through. And really all of it was saying, you really need at least a two year period to go through this. And I said, okay, I'm not going to try to push it. I'm not going to try to rush it. I want to feel this very deeply so that I can get out on the other side and never go through this grief cycle again. Um, so I think that with some of my friends and people that I know, what I saw was they would try to jump to, you know, being happy and forcing the next step and moving on. And then it would just get worse and worse as years went on. Um, and people would tell me time heals everything, but I realized time doesn't necessarily heal it. It can actually make it worse. <laughs> you know, right. what you do with that time matters. You can become more resentful the more time that goes on, or you can heal more the more that time goes on. And so I just knew for my son, it was going to be so important for me to take the time to grieve now and then actually go through healing versus becoming more bitter and more resentful and more depressed as time went on. Mm. And so did it take you two years? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost. So it took, it took probably more like a year initially, like I said, to be through the not crying every day. I do know, you know, I was journaling and kind of keeping track of how things were going. And after a year is when I would start not feeling those same things on a daily basis. Um, but it was still pretty up and down. Part of that was because my ex-husband and I were still going through court stuff. And so that, um, you know, going back to court, renegotiating custody type stuff. So that of course exacerbates it a little bit. Once that calmed down after two years, that really made a difference. Um, but even in the midst of that, after a year, I saw kind of a turning point. I mean, you've been through all your first holidays that are different, right? Christmas is really, really hard. Birthdays are hard, all of those firsts. Mm -hmm. So you've been through all your firsts after one year. And I really did give myself, like I said, time to lay in bed and be in my parents' basement for as much as I wanted that whole year. I did almost nothing with that year. And then after that, I could kind of say, okay, now what? Now what do I want to do? You know, now that I've really felt all of that mm -hmm. and embraced it and just, I just leaned into it and accepted any of those feelings that were coming, then I realized um, this was not the end. This was the beginning. And I know that sounds super cliche to say, but for me, it couldn't be more true because at that point, I just realized there were some specific things I had always wanted to do in my life that I didn't. Um, and that was join the military and go to law school. And I wasn't necessarily going to be able to do those things in my previous situation. And so now I realized this is my chance to finally do the things I've always wanted to do. 
Um, and yes, I had a child now. And yes, my situation was different than I had expected, but I decided to do it anyway. So that second year is when I started moving forward in really small ways to make those things happen. I finished my undergrad degree. I started studying for the LSAT. I you know, started looking into and applying to join the military. Um, so it was kind of that realization and that turning point of saying, now I can make my life anything I want to. And that was a really, a really cool thought. You know, I just hadn't, I didn't get there for a while. And then once I did, it was incredible. Like I could, I could go anywhere in the world. I could do anything I wanted. Yeah. You know, it was just really, you can make your life whatever you want. And that was a, an incredibly empowering thing for me. And so you joined the military before you started law school, right? <laughs> That's right. Right before. Yes. Right <laughs> so before. I, yeah, I, I had timed it basically where I joined, went to basic training in April, finished basic training in tech school, specifically chose a tech school that would be the shortest so that I could graduate in time to go to law school. So I finished that end of July had two weeks to move to California and then start wow. law school orientation two weeks later. So it was, it was kind of a crazy time, but I've never felt better in that situation. It was graduating from basic training in tech school and then starting law school at Berkeley and moving to California with my son. It was, you know, the two of us on our own for the first time. It was just so many things happening at once, but it was kind of just that daily realization that I am doing this. Like I would just sit there and think, wow, I'm, I'm really doing this. <laughs> you know, all of these things I had imagined in my head for so long, it was finally happening and just taking each step every single day and realizing it was working and it, it was going to be okay. Basically. I think that that, that at that point, when I moved and started law school and had just graduated from the military, um, that was kind of the realization that this is going to work. Like we're going to be okay. <laughs> and that was the first time I think I felt that way. Do you think that if you had stayed married, that this is what you'd be doing right now? Uh, no, definitely, definitely not. Um, again, it was just a, a completely different situation. Um, my ex-husband definitely did not want me to join the military. So that was never going to be an option. Um, there were just many other things at play there. Um, moving from the state that we lived in was not an option due to his job, all, all sorts of things. And so um, just basically everything I've done in my life in the last couple of years would not have been possible at all if I had stayed married. Um, and that is, again, you know, so many times I look at the life my son and I have now, he just turned four. And I do realize that in every single possible way, this would not have occurred if I had stayed in that situation. And you know, my, my ex-husband and I are on fine terms now, and he even agrees as well. Honestly, both of our lives are in a better place because that's what needed to happen. And it was never going to be a healthy relationship, and it was certainly not going to be a good thing for our son. Right, right. And did you have a moment when you moved to California and it's just the two of you in your in your brand new apartment and looking back and saying, oh my God, like, whoa, what happened? What are we doing? How do we go move forward? What, what happens from here? Completely. So it was, you know, a high and I felt all empowered from all the things that had happened. But then all of a sudden, when my family had helped me move into my apartment in Berkeley and I was starting law school orientation, then they all went back home and I was there alone with Jace for the first time. Um, and he started at a new preschool, all of this was happening. And I knew no one in the town, um, in the city. I, you know, didn't know my way around. <laughs> I didn't even have all my boxes unpacked. It was sitting there and realizing I am really on my own. Um, and that is a scary feeling. It's just realizing if anything happened to me, I didn't know what was going to happen. Right, you know, right. I, there would be emergency contact forms and I'm like, who do I even put down? Cause I don't have anyone here. Wow. I so, mean, that's so something the, you don't ever think of. Right. So for the first semester of law school, there was certainly, um, a, a bit of overwhelm there. 
where I had some more times of crying about wondering if I did the right thing, um, wondering if I was crazy to do this. I'm the only single parent in my law school class. Wow. You know, there's a reason why <laughs> single parents don't often go pursue, you know, higher education all of a sudden right. at top schools, that kind of thing. It's demanding. And, um, you know, I talked to professors, I cried in a couple of professors' offices, <laughs> I, you know, and, but yet, everybody was so awesome that very quickly within that first semester, I had professors, friends, a church community, law school community who were constantly offering help, mm -hmm. friends who started watching Jace when I needed it, people that just rallied around like really quickly found that village of people who were so willing to support me in this. Um, you know, even the interviews that I was doing for my first law job, I wouldn't have been able to do those interviews if it weren't for my law school friends who were willing to come and watch my son so I could go do those interviews. You know, it wow. was just this constant outpouring of people who were supportive and wonderful. And again, then every time that happened, I would have to sit back and realize we're going to be okay. <laughs> you know, right. this is going to work. I'm just going to keep working as hard as I can. I'm going to keep doing my best. Jace is doing amazing. <laughs> and, you know, this is going to keep working. Um, I can't distance myself from people and I have to ask people for more help than I would like to, you know, and I kind of have to get over that piece of it. But it is going to be okay. And people do care and they want to help. People were impressed and proud of me for doing this law school thing as a single parent, you know, oh, yeah. and, and so it was just really cool to see that, um, that we were going to be okay. So after that first semester, I would say, for the most part, there was no more of that kind of worry of like, what am I doing? This is too much. It was every day I could just say, I know we're going to be okay. And I know I can do this. The first year of law school is is not a joke either. <laughs> no, I mean, you're, no. you're talking about just like, you know, the, the logistics of everything, but it also right. requires a huge amount of time and studying. And yeah. so, I, you know, I'm impressed and I'm in, in awe because sometimes like I can barely get dressed and like, I, I went to court one day with my dress on backwards. That's a, that's a true story. I had this black dress and there was a gold zipper running down my front and I looked down and I'm like, I don't remember having a dress with a zipper down the front because it belonged in the back. So I, I am- It's a new fashion, you know, it's, it's reversible. I know, so but I am so in awe because of everything that you're doing on your own. And yet mm. I also think that your message to ask for help is, is you know, definitely so valuable too, because so yes. often we don't want to do that. And we just, Oh yeah. On our own. Well, and one thing I definitely had to get over was guilt too, because once I started law school, you're right, because it takes so much time. I was spending so much time away from my son and I felt so guilty for so long about that. He was going to a, a daycare preschool for the first time ever, you know, and, and I had never spent constantly day in and day out. It was like 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through right. Friday that I was away from him. And that was that made me feel really guilty. And then having maybe babysitters or friends on top of that, that was even mm -hmm. more time away. Um, and so I definitely realized that yes, I had to get over my pride and ask other people for help. Then I also had to get over the guilt and say, I'm doing the best I can and it's going to be worth it. And then the other thing that I learned also from some other moms and law professors and that sort of thing um, was not thinking that you have to do it all because right. for the first time in my life, I really decided to distill my life down to only the things that were most important. And that was the first year of law school was law school and Jace only. No extracurriculars, barely any social activities, you know, just nothing extra. Mm -hmm. Plus, I learned to hire someone to clean my apartment once a month. That's key. And I learned to not cook. <laughs> because yeah. I was like, trying to cook all the time was also too stressful, taking too much time, you know, so it was those small things that seemed silly, but that I realized I was actually stressing myself way beyond necessary um, for these little things just because they caused guilt. And eventually now I got to the point where I just don't feel guilty about that anymore. You know, I have to say no to things and that's okay because I know what my priorities are finally. Um, and I think that that really changed when I had Jace. I was not that person before. I tried to say yes to everything. I tried to do everything. I felt guilty if I didn't. And, and, and now being on my own with him, that's really forced me to finally 
prioritize and, and say no to things. And I know that probably everyone out there who's listening is saying, yes, that's me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what can I do to not cook? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely. I always got, you know, pre-made meals or mostly we do, you know, cold types of things, meat and cheese and fruits and vegetables that all don't have to be cooked or heated. And it's great. You know, it's easy. We still eat healthy. You can do salads, you can do sandwiches, you can do shakes, you can do all sorts of stuff. But it was like, why am I, why am I killing myself over this and stressing myself out over something so right. ridiculous? And yes, if I see, you know, Instagram posts about moms who cook all this amazing stuff, I have to kind of turn my, mm-hmm. <laughs> turn my eyes and look at other things. But you you know, so you know, they're cracking open the box of mac and cheese though. <laughs> yes. Not real. <laughs> yes. And, you know, the other thing too, I realized that that's okay if someone's priority really is that they want to do that every day. That's awesome. You know, that was, and that was probably part of my guilt came from being raised by a mom Mm. who homeschooled all six of us, was a stay at home mom, cooked, cleaned, did everything. And so for me to try to compare myself to her, that's impossible. You know, she wasn't in law school. She wasn't in the military. She wasn't a single mom. So I think that some of those things that we grow up with and comparing ourselves to other people can be really harmful if we use it as a measuring stick for ourselves. Right. And as a working mother, that that guilt doesn't Mm -hmm. ever go away. And it's so silly that we do that to ourselves, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But we do it. And we're all we're always comparing ourselves to someone else who doesn't have that same that same circumstance. And you know, I had the same thing. My mother was a stay at home mom. Mm -hmm. And you Mm -hmm. look at that and you want to hold on to those values that Mm -hmm. you grew up in, but yet you're out there and you're working and you're doing other things and you're responsible for so much. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why in, in law school, what I realized was, um, I could decide very consciously that Saturday and Sunday were going to be my days with Jace. And I wasn't even going to do any school on the weekends. And, you know, you talk about, yeah, the first year of law school is so, so difficult, but what I kind of realized is I've sort of had a better time with my first year of law school than a lot of my peers because I had that break with Jace that on the weekends I was outside with him. I was having fun. I was doing other things. And then I would just work really hard on the days, Monday through Friday, while he's at preschool, while I'm in school. So it kind of forced me to compartmentalize more and be really efficient and just work when I could with the hours that I had and do my best and then say, okay, I'm done now I'm going to spend time with my child. And so that was really a a good balance, I think, to have throughout law school and still is. It's very helpful to me. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change that for the world. Honestly, I I kind of feel like it's been a benefit to have a child in law school because it's really helped me, at least for my personality, to have that balance. Right. So you've done so much already. What is next on tap? Because I feel like your story does not end just with law school (laughs) because there's so much more coming. (laughs) So uh, we live in Berkeley and I'm finishing my last year. Like you said, I've got one year of law school left and then I'll graduate. Um, And then we are moving to Houston, Texas, where I'll be working for a firm in business litigation. So I'm very excited to finally start the career that I had always wanted to pursue. Um, I'll still be in the military. I have a few more years on my commitment there. And then I'm looking into hopefully transitioning into being a JAG in the military and commissioning as an officer. Um, I'd love to do legal work on, on that side of my life as well and my work. Um, after that, I think in the future, I would love to transition to criminal work. Um, it's sort of, you know, within law, I enjoy just about anything. I haven't found anything that I, uh, that is, that bores me or that I don't like. (laughs) So I'm kind of open. Give it time. (laughs) But uh, I'm kind of right now open to practicing anything. And then, yeah, as I figure out what I'm really interested in and where my talents best lie over the next coming years, then, then I can kind of tailor, um, what areas I really want to go into further there. Um, but I'm excited to, to finally be um, in, that, in that place moving forward with my career. And yet I'm still really trying to make the most of this last year of law school because I know, you know, that's a special time too and not trying to jump ahead to the next thing yet, which I'm classically bad at. <laughs> 
but I'm Same. excited. I think the, yeah, I think the, uh, the coming years are going to be a lot of fun. And again, I've just realized that, you know, Jace and I can go anywhere and do anything and we're going to be okay. You know, when we move to Houston, we're going to have to once again, do the whole thing again, make new friends, find our way around, settle in, you know, get comfortable again. And, and yet now it's not as scary facing that transition because I know I've done it before and it's going to be okay. Um, so that's, that's a good feeling to finally be in that place. You have mastered the art of being uncomfortable, you <laughs> yes. know, like that moving is so uncomfortable for people, just moving mm -hmm. towns, moving states, but you, you've gone yeah. across the country and <laughs> put yourself into situations that are so new. And mm -hmm. what do you tell someone who doesn't have that same, like, bravery or you know the they're scared to to make that yeah. commitment yeah well i i mean i think there are a couple things i do have to recognize that i'm definitely privileged in having a, a safety net of a family that's always there for me and i know that not everybody has that but I, I would venture to say that some of us have more of a safety net than we realize that we, again, we have friends and family members who are actually willing to do more than we expect. And they're willing to help us and support us in ways that we don't realize because we've never asked. And honestly, until I asked, I never knew that. I mean, even joining the military, I thought was going to be impossible because you have to be at basic training for three months. But I had never asked my family if they could really take care of my son for that period of time, you know? And so you just don't know until you try and really lean into the resources and support that you have. Um, as far as making big, scary transitions, one way I kind of practice to this day is I consciously plan to do something new every month. Mm. So this can be in small ways or big ways, you know, it can be skydiving or it can be learning a language or it can be just cooking something new, whatever, but trying something new that makes me sort of uncomfortable so that I never get comfortable again. Um, Cause I don't think that you can really make it, like you said, become uh, just very immersed in that idea of feeling uncomfortable and being okay with it and sitting in that mm -hmm. um, without some practice. Right. And so I do think that, um, you know, as a parent or a single parent is something we can totally do is practice that getting uncomfortable and trying new things and our kids see it and they learn from that. And then we're learning from it. Right. And then it makes some of those big things not seem so scary because you think, you know, I've done new things in the past. I've learned new things. I've tried new things. And, and be smart about it, again, in, in having, you know, a plan B or a safety net or a backup option or something, but at the same time, really being willing to take those risks and then realize you are going to be okay and you can just keep moving forward. What types of things have you done that have been uncomfortable? <laughs> oh, now goodness. I'm curious. I, I, yeah, right? <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd have to look at my list. But Did you go something... skydiving? I have not yet. I have wanted mm -hmm. to for so long. It's on my bucket list, um, as well as going in a hot air balloon. Those are definitely two mm -hmm. things. Um, traveling to every state in the country was one. Um, I've done a couple long cross country road trips. I've been to every state except Alaska now. So almost have been to all 50. Mm -hmm. Traveling in general, I think particularly traveling by yourself can really help create yeah. that feeling uncomfortable, doing it anyway kind of thing, going places where you don't know the language, being around people that, you know, you haven't been comfortable around before, have never met before. Um, in the past, I would also do like volunteer activities, go volunteer with a local group, you know, in Berkeley, um, dealing with the population that are homeless, that sort of thing, just working with different people groups that maybe you would feel uncomfortable around or something. Um, and then let's see, when I lived in the DC area during my undergrad, I would even do things like go to new shows like I'd never been to an opera before so I went to an opera at the Kennedy Center and just exposing myself to new cultural things or trying a new food again it can be big things or small things um, I think mm -hmm. since having Jace some of my new things have just come naturally obviously <laughs> because when you have a child right. you, you are constantly doing things you've never done before, uh, potty training, you know, <laughs> being peed on, all sorts of things. Right. You just you've just <laughs> never done them before, so now all of a sudden you're trying new things. Um, but you know, once you get in, once you get to the point where you're realizing, okay, now I'm not really doing a bunch of new things all the time. Maybe I need to intentionally do this again and 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 really consciously try some new things now. 
it's such great advice. And I tell people who are, who are afraid of moving on or afraid of being alone, just to date themselves and like go out to eat to a nice restaurant by yourself. And by yourself, people yes. don't know how to do that. Yes. It's so peaceful just to sit there and buy yourself yes. a really nice place. You know, start small like that. Absolutely. Oh, it's, it's such a good idea too, because I do think that that's also, I mean, even when you're moving to something that's so important is a lot of times, I mean, I haven't dated much at all and mostly it's just been by myself or myself and Jace doing things. But I, right when I moved to Berkeley, I made a list of all the things in the area I wanted to see and do. And you're right. It is kind of just like dating yourself, not waiting for someone to come along and do those things. But do the things you've always wanted to do. Don't wait right. for, you know, oh, someone special to share it with or something like right. that. I, I realize, you know, this is my life. I can mm -hmm. just do these things. The fun right. thing about being an adult is you can really do whatever you want. <laughs> so, oh, I know, right? <laughs> every yeah. day I think that I could go eat wherever I want. I could do whatever mm -hmm. I want. And it's an exciting thing to have that kind of freedom again. Except sleep in. When you have a four-year-old, you can't sleep in. <laughs> Very true. That's the one thing that you cannot and will not do. <laughs> so, Teresa, some final words of wisdom to the woman out there who is listening to you and is just terrified of what the future holds of being alone. Mm. Oh, goodness. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily words of wisdom, except I know what that feels like. Um, and I've been there and some days I'm still there in some ways. And I think maybe the most important thing was for me to realize that it was going to be ups and downs, not a continual upward trajectory. Because even now, sometimes it's easy for me to think every single day is supposed to be better than the last. And that's not true. You know, sometimes you take several, several steps back. Some days you need to be sad again. Some days you need to feel this way or that way and that's okay. Um, I think it's just not judging yourself for the emotions that you're going through and saying you're allowed to feel whatever you feel. Um, I spent so long in this should realm, you know, you should do this, you shouldn't feel that, you should, and I just don't think that's helpful. I don't right. think it does anything for our healing, mm -hmm. and I think instead we can just embrace what is and say, hey, this is, this is what is right now, and this is what I feel right now, and it's going to feel like this for a long time, and that's okay, um, and not this constant race to, well, now I should be happy, or now right. everything should be great. Um, that may not be the case. Right. Um, so, you know, whether it's your relationship with your ex or anything like that, there's going to be the ups and downs, there's going to be the back and forth, um, but overall, I think it's that constant embracing what is each day that actually propels us forward. Because the only way I was able to keep taking steps forward every day was just embracing what, what is in every moment. And that's what I'm planning on doing moving forward as well. That's great. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know. Um, so where can we follow you and continue to watch your journey and all the travels <laughs> yeah. that we're coming? Maybe <laughs> it's just... So it's maybe just a future run for like senator or something. I don't know. <laughs> we'll, I can we'll see, see politics in your future. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. It's just Teresa Scanlon on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So any of those places. And yeah, we'll, we'll see what the future holds. Awesome. And also the, uh, there'll be some links in the show notes too. So thank you so much for sharing your journey. And thank you. So inspiring. Thank you.